help me welcome Professor Sir David King. Thank you very much. Delighted to be with you. Um, actually, back in my old college before I became Master of Downing. So, Chris, thank you for the hospitality. Um, I am going to start from that point where I became Chief Scientific Advisor. Um, within a month of my taking up my post, we had the world's biggest foot and mouth disease epidemic here in the UK. Uh, at that point, I had uh, no expertise in that area whatsoever. Um, I could not even get my lips around the word epidemiology. And uh, I, I very quickly, of course, as Chief Scientific Advisor, was able to bring experts around me. And we, we managed to model the epidemic uh, very quickly. And as soon as we'd done that, we realized that the Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Fisheries had got the control process wrong, uh, that the epidemic was completely out of control. And using these models, we were able to model the process to bring it under control. At this point, the Prime Minister of Britain was in a, a, a bit of a tizzy, as he says in his autobiography, because nobody was showing him the way out and he was heading towards an election. And so uh, I arrived and simply said, this is how it's happening, it's out of control, but this is what we can do. And so within two days, I had taken control of the whole epidemic, flying around in a helicopter every day, not expecting this to be the job of the chief scientific advisor, but having to see that everything was implemented that we were proposing. Uh, we were using the Ministry of Defense to implement what we proposed, this operation for the Ministry of Defense was as big as the Afghanistan war. I mean, it was a massive operation. 70 farms going down every day when we took this over. Now, the point of telling you this story is twofold. One, uh, the exponential growth when I took over became exponential decay within two days. The, uncannily, the data points started falling on my curves. The Prime Minister took a look at my curves and said, are you sure that we're on this pathway? I said yes, and he called the election on the basis of this curve apparently going to zero on June the 7th. Uh, actually, this was a linear plot, and it wasn't going to zero at all. But nevertheless, they won the election, and uh, because I was reporting to the Prime Minister every day over eight weeks, and because I was reporting to the Cabinet on a frequent basis, I suddenly had a high profile in the Cabinet. But also because the Prime Minister didn't quite understand, as he says in his autobiography, a word of what I was saying. Uh, he just put me out on the television and radio, and so I got a public voice out of it as well. The net result was twofold. I, I decided never to put myself in that position again, where I was suddenly faced with a crisis and we had no preparation for it. But secondly, was to, uh, and so I set up a very detailed foresight program. And let me just... Uh, show you the, the programs that I, I ran through in that time uh, for the following seven and a half years. These are the programs we conducted. So th the idea of the Foresight program was that we should be prepared in advance for potential crises like infectious diseases and that we should uh, also seize opportunities into the future. This was a unique program in government because we were taking a look not at next year or next week or tomorrow, uh, as most government ministers are concerned about, but we were taking a look between 20 and 80 years into the future. So it, it was uh, looking for long-term opportunities and risks. Uh, the second part of the story of telling there is that having gained the trust of the Prime Minister, I could then switch his attention over to what I thought was the biggest challenge of the day, that is climate change, and I do not believe I would have got the voice of the Prime Minister at, behind me on that and the Cabinet behind me. And finally, we ended up with the Climate Change Act just after I left, but I was preparing it in 2008, all-party agreement on the Climate Change Act. That's a, a unique situation. Uh, the reason we got all-party agreement, let me tell you, is that that first foresight program that we conducted was on flood and coastal defences for the United Kingdom. The British Isles, uh, as sea levels rise and storms change, storm patterns change, are most at risk from flooding. That was a very simple conclusion from a very detailed three-year analysis. I used about 1,500 academics over these studies, over this period. 
I realized that I had to be the interface between the government, the decision makers, and the state of knowledge as it is now. There is no other piece of government that provides that process. Uh, and so that, that was the, the, the real basis for this. The Flood and Coastal Defence Programme said the British Isles will suffer from flooding. I reported to Parliament in 2004, and I said, well, under the worst case scenario, by the end of the century, we're going to have to use the military phrase, ordered retreat. We have to retreat from the boundaries of Britain because it would become too difficult to defend our coastline. But if we went on a, on a scenario in which the rest of the world mitigates, reduces carbon dioxide emissions, then we could manage to protect our borders essentially as they are, losing a bit of Suffolk on the way. So essentially, what, what Parliament, first of all, asked me not to put this into the public domain. I couldn't agree to that. Some of them saw their constituencies going underwater. Um, but secondly, uh, they, they realised that it was the best case scenario that we had to be on if the British Isles were going to survive in a form that we recognise, and particularly if we could manage to maintain London as it is. Now, I'm deviating from my general story, but I'm, I want to finish this because, of course, then we get the floods this winter. And guess what? They, the pattern of behaviour of those floods is exactly what we were saying we needed to be prepared against. And so it was a wonderful exercise to see whether what we'd put in place through the Environment Agency as a result of that 2004 report actually managed the problem. Now, we had advised government uh, to spend starting at half a billion pounds extra on flood coastal defences, rising to one billion by 2020 and rising beyond that. <clears throat> Unfortunately, the, the downturn in uh, the uh, economy came along and so that budget is today about 400,000 extra for, for these defences. Nevertheless, the main punchline for the floods is that for all that you look at the pictures on television screens and see England underwater, those places that were underwater were deliberately chosen by us to be floodplains. We saved every one of our major assets. London was not even flooded at all. No part of London was flooded. So the floodwaters were deflected into valleys. We had got those areas designated as floodplains. Finally, there was a, a parliamentary act in 2010, and, and we had advised no new buildings to go on those floodplains. Now, unfortunately, local agencies, uh, 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 local authorities had uh, given uh, uh, permission to build uh, to 40% of applicants in the floodplains. I don't think it'll happen again. So, net result, damage to Britain probably will cost between 10 and 15 billion pounds to repair from the flood damage. I, my estimate of the amount saved with that process runs into hundreds of billions. Right? London being flooded would have been disastrous. We used the Thames barrier 51 times in 15 weeks. The Thames barrier was designed to be used once every six years. Right, so, but every time it was used, the flood waters were back into the, the valleys, and unfortunately, the Thames Valley is where many members of parliament have their constituencies. All right, that's the, the background story. The, these uh, uh, programs here uh, impacted on many different parts of government, and overall, I worked with 30 ministers because I, had a, I never took on a program without at least one minister taking charge of the outcomes of the program. The ministers, by the way, loved it. Because when you're looking 80 years hence, they feel they're in a safe space. They're not going to have to make decisions. But actually, we, we would bring them back to the present day and say, now, we have to make decisions today to see that we end up in the right place in 80 years' time. So it did impact on them, but by that time, they were usually hooked on the program. So the, the normal fear of a government minister about decision-making was overwhelmed. All right, so... These programs here have given me the background for what I'm going to talk about, which is an extremely broad view of what I consider to be the, the, new, the new challenges of the 21st century. I'm, I'm going to make a, a statement and then try and defend it. And the statement is that in the 21st century, we are faced 
with a set of challenges that are qualitatively different from the challenges we solved in the 20th century. The success of our solving those challenges in the 20th century, we can measure by population growth and by the rise in lifespan over the 20th century. The two totally interconnected. So what, what we saw was population uh, life expectancy globally below 40 at the beginning of the 20th century, rising towards 70, 80 by the end of the century. There's the measure of the success, science, engineering, medicine, technology, playing out into society and spreading around the world uh, through British Empire and other mechanisms. The net result of that, of course, is a hangover for the 21st century because as human lifespan increases, the group that, that advances fastest is children. And so many more children survive into maturity. And when children survive into maturity, they tend to do that thing. They have children themselves. And so there's a sudden population explosion. That's true of every country. All right, so Britain, we used to have an average of seven children per woman for hundreds of years, of which two survived into maturity, giving a stable population. And then as well-being comes through rapidly through the Industrial Revolution, all seven survive into maturity. And for two generations, women don't quite catch on. And then in the third generation, suddenly the number of children per woman collapses to 2.12. Britain is sitting on two today and has been for a long time. So th there's a kind of, I, I would like to say it's an automatic response. It isn't. It's uh, female education, female empowerment, availability of contraceptives, nothing to do with men. I give them no credit whatsoever. But what it means is that globally today, population expansion that occurred at starting one and a half billion at the beginning of the 20th century, adding a billion every 12 years, population explosion is now a done deal. Uh, we've got a global average for, for women today, 2.2. Global average. And if we look at uh, where we need to be for a stable population, it's 2.1. In a few years, we'll be at 2.1. What that means is today we have 2 billion in the cohort 0 to 15. And as we move forward in time, that 2 billion eventually replaces a cohort in the over 60s, which is only 1 billion. And so the remaining population growth is simply the demographic movement of the under 15 year olds. But in, in 15 years time, there will still be only 2 billion under 15s. So the remaining population growth is written in already. About 9 billion by mid-century is the IASA best figure. Uh, now that, that in itself is a challenge, but as I say, it's a done deal. We have to live with it and there's no point in talking about uh, population, in my view, as the problem. But here's the underlying demographic trend that is tremendous, the proportion of middle class people rising rapidly now. And by middle class, you'll see that as a scientist, I'm trying to define my terms, those who spend between 10 and $100 a day. All of you fit into that category. And it was 1 billion in the year 2000. Last year passed 2 billion. We've already doubled the number of middle class consumers on the planet. And the expectation figure is from what all the economists tell me, and I, we all know how reliable that is. Um, the, the expectation is approaching 5 billion by 2030. Five-fold increase in middle class consumers. There's the big challenge of the 21st century. Has this single planet got the resource capability of delivering the expectations of 5 billion middle class inhabitants on the, on, on the surface of the earth? And I believe that the pattern of behavior that we developed in the 20th century is completely unable to deliver. And so what we will see is not 5, five billion middle class people if we continue that consumption behavior of the 20th century, I think this will stutter and falter and will not reach that point. Right? So, in other words, I, unless we qualitatively change our economic and human behavior, we're not going to manage to achieve this, and instead we will be faced with a set of even more severe challenges. 
This is not a simple task. So what I'm suggesting is that because of this demographic driver, the rising middle class consumers on the planet's surface, good news for them, of course, we are collecting together a set of simultaneous challenges. This has become what a physicist would refer to as a many-body problem. Right? So it's all coming at us at once, driven by the demographics. So if we take, when I say many-body problem, let me uh, underline that. If I take water resource, then in the city of Melbourne and its environment, and the environment used to be the breadbasket of Australia, high rainfall area, green land, drought for 14 years. Some years it hasn't been in drought, but certainly fresh water is not falling as it used to in that area. Non-saline aquifers drained. Farming, they've packed up. And Melbourne has a massive water-saving program. Now, they also have the availability of technology. And the technology is desalination. And desalination, hooray, we can turn salt water into fresh water, however, is an energy-intensive process. So what they will do and are doing is burning coal to make water. So you shift the curve across to energy security and supply. Now, you may say, well, they've got lots of coal, so that's fine. That's what they say, too. It's cheap. In the Middle East, they're burning oil to make fresh water. Every glass of water you drink in Saudi Arabia will be desalinated water, most, most of it, uh, produced by burning oil. Now, how on earth can they do that when oil is $120 a barrel? Well, they do it by subsidizing oil. Massive subsidy, $5 a barrel. Right? So you don't get, you get perverse behavior with these subsidies, and the, this is one of the most perverse behaviors around. Right? So what, why do I say that? In South Australia, what is causing the problem is more and more sunlight, less and less cloudy days. Saudi Arabia needs it precisely because they have no rain, but they've got plenty of solar energy. They're not using solar energy to convert saline water into fresh water because it's easier, the technology is there, and we create a cheap resource out of the fuel. Now, I'm jumping across to climate change now, because we all know that burning those fossil fuels produces carbon dioxide, which causes climate change, oh, which is causing the desertification that we're trying to handle in the first place. So you, you start dealing with problems one at a time, and you find that you're causing major problems elsewhere on this curve. If we provide more and more food, for example, especially beef, let's say, beef, the big culprit is what I'm going to say, that if we provide more and more food by removing more and more forests, we're removing the ecosystems that we know we need. We evolved with ecosystems as they were at the, before the Industrial Revolution. The danger is that we wreck the very ecosystems that provide us with the mechanisms, all the mechanisms for our survival. So food production and ecosystems interact. Every time the demand for beef goes up, the farmers of Mato Grossi call the loggers in and extend their farms into what was forested areas. The number of animals per hectare in Mato Grossi average is one. You know the production of beef takes between 12 and 15,000 litres of fresh water. And this they do by allowing the cattle to roam over large areas. If we go over to Malaysia, Indonesia, then of course we're losing the forests to meet the global demands, I'm not blaming the people there, the global demand for palm oil. And so what we're doing is creating continued pressure on the global ecosystems. Minerals, the, the cheap minerals have been mined. The easy big veins have been mined. And so as we move forward, one of the big challenges is can we provide the food, the energy, the minerals to meet the commodity demand from that rapidly rising middle class? And what happens if we don't? Right. Um, so there's, there's the, the basis of, of what I'm saying in, in one graph. Um, I'm going to, to move it on. Conflict and terrorism, let me just mention that very quickly. Environmental migration 
is already beginning to happen, will grow into quite a big process. Now, when the, when the Han people uh, were in charge of China back in the 15th century and uh, over-farmed the Lush Plateau, they were, uh, the emperor was able to shift his people across to Beijing because it was a very sparse population and it was a very green land. And so they simply shifted the population over. Environmental migration has always occurred, but not with the consequences that would happen in a planet which is already heavily populated. So why is India building a big fence around Bangladesh? Right. Bangladesh, below sea level, a lot of it suffers from hurricanes, as we know, and the sea levels are rising. And that impacts directly on the available land area for the people of Bangladesh to live. Very high density population. And India doesn't want to take up the consequences of that population uh, movement and what about all of the small island states? Never mind the British Isles surrounded by water. What about the small island states that will disappear first? So what, what we see is that we're in for a period of population migration. But it's not only rising sea levels, of course. It's availability of food. In South Australia, they can manage this increased desertification simply by buying food in. But what if you're a society that hasn't got that sort of finance? Uh, how do you manage to keep feeding if your area has become desertified, which, of course, is happening in North Africa, and I fear it's happening down in the southern part of Africa as well. Now, here's both the, the bad news and the good news. So I'm, I'm looking at a, particularly, a particular basket of commodity prices. This is minerals, food, and energy. And it's the, th this MGI index actually goes back to 1900. It's worth looking at. Uh, basically, if you look at the commodity prices, they, they are today two and a half times higher than they've ever been in the 20th century. We expected, that, uh, the economists expected, that with improving technology, commodity prices would keep coming down. So why have they gone up? They've gone up because of this massive demand from this new middle class on the one hand and because of the low-hanging fruit already being taken previously. Commodity demand can be met but always at a higher cost because the production costs are going up uh, as, as we keep mining deeper and deeper into the ground for, for tantalite and so on. So... Commodity prices go shooting up alongside that growth in the new middle class. By the way, 95% of that growth in the Asia-Pacific region. Right, so this is the switching balance of what is happening in the world. Now, 2007, we have a global financial crisis. And those of us who watched this index thought, here we go, it's going to go down and hit the floor. Because in 1929, during that financial crisis, commodity prices collapsed. Overproduction of commodities, financial crisis, demand has collapsed, commodity prices had to fall. Overproduction of commodities compared with demand. Now, those of us who are scientists understand something that not many economists do, and that is feedback effects. You've got very cheap commodities around. You can regrow your economy off the back of a much lower GDP. I believe that feedback mechanism was a critical part of the regrowth of the economy of 1929-1932. It was only three years to recover. Now, so the commodity prices started falling on an expectation basis that was wrong. And up they went again. So what I'm suggesting is our faltering attempts to regrow our economies are because we haven't quite recognised this problem. But the Cheap commodities are not going to be, help us out this time because of this rapid growth in the middle class, which exists very largely in a part of the world which didn't start the crisis with a large amount of debt. Right? China has a very large surplus. So they can take up the cost of commodities at these much higher prices, imports, they can take it up because they have this very large surplus. Not for very long. Not for very long. So... I don't think this can continue unless the, the model is dramatically changed. Uh, the model of behavior is what I'm referring to. 
Now, the good news in this is that surely, every economist will tell you this, this is the driver for change. If, if prices are going high, the opportunities for new behavior to come through, commodity conserving behavior, is going to be massive. So you would think that we would have understood that message and we would see all the entrepreneurs coming through with businesses that are fit for the 21st century. And that may well be happening. And the only question I have is, and how long will it take? Right? Have we got time? Now, this is the changing pattern of food consumption. I see that all our papers are saying this morning, five portions of vegetables and fruit isn't enough. It should be perhaps seven or 10 a day. Well, quite right. Let's cut down on beef for a starter. So middle-class behavior tends towards more and more meat consumption. Twice now, I've given this lecture and afterwards been taken out for dinner to be faced in the United States, but also last week in South Africa, with a plate with meat hanging off the edge. Uh, 16 ounces of beef, for goodness sake, for one person for a meal, you feed a family of five that amount of protein over a week and you're doing fine. All right, so we, we are, this is nothing to do with improving human well-being. This is simply uh, massive overconsumption. Meat is now the, the food of preference because of this rapid rise in the middle class. And that, that curve is, is due, as you see, to keep taking off uh, into the future. Um, yes, I'm afraid it's not going to be realized. These curves that go into the future assume continued exponential GDP growth and assume that there's no commodity challenge. All right, so th that's my problem with economists not accounting for commodity shortages and commodity challenges. Here's a, a we, we plotted this graph for fun and then looked at it and realized we were sitting on something quite important and we published it in, uh, in Nature in 2012 because it looks like a phase change. All we're doing is plotting crude oil production, horizontal axis against vertical axis, Brent crude spot price. And you'll see that when we were producing 64.5 million barrels of oil a day, the spot price was $15 a barrel. In real terms, it's hard to remember that we used to pay only $15 a barrel globally for oil. Now, when, when is that? That's 1998. So the timeline is given up in the top left-hand corner. And demand goes up to 74 million barrels a day, and the price goes up to $40 a barrel. The terminology from the economist is that this is elastic supply demand. You, you keep increasing demand, you can push your price up to meet the demand. Production costs aren't reflected in that, that's much more to do with rent and profit. Then something peculiar happens. We still haven't gone above 75 million barrels a day, and the turning point, that transition point is 2005, and the price shot up to $120, $140 a barrel. So what happened there? Price volatility up that black dot curve is massive. So what happened there? Well, it's quite simple. No oil company will do what we did here, which is separate crude oil from all other oil sources. Crude oil production has hit a wall of 75 million, 74 million barrels a day. It's heroic to keep it up at that level because every major oil field is currently being depleted. Right? So in other words, they're keeping it up by extracting more quickly remaining oil. This can't go on forever. So what, so what I'm absolutely convinced will happen, I wish I had a pointer, but anyway, what, what will happen is that this curve will go up and backwards. Right? So production of crude oil will go, oh, I've got a pointer, there we are. All right, this curve will go up and backwards. But demand today is 92 million barrels a day. All right, so demand is way off here. So since 2005, the oil companies have been busting a gut to produce oil from every other kind of source. Tar sands, Canada, Venezuela, Gulf of Mexico, two miles down. Now, when I say bust a gut, that was an unfortunate phrase. For BP. They went into the Gulf of Mexico, 
pushing technology as hard as they could push it because demand was there. And their job is to meet demand. And I'm simply saying that that accident in the Gulf of Mexico was technology unready for this amazing new process that they were pushing through. Mining oil starting two miles down and then down into the earth below that. They're producing oil to meet demand at high cost. If you take tar sands, you have to hydrogenate it, so it's also high energy cost. Right? So all of these new sources of oil that are coming on stream are nothing like crude oil. You, you punch the granite, a hole in the granite for crude oil and it comes shooting out of the ground for you and you just put a bucket under it. This process is expensive. And of course the marginal cost to meet the, the last barrel of oil that is demanded becomes the cost that everyone charges. Right, so no, except if you live in the Middle East. So basically, I'm suggesting cheap oil days are over. And again, this could be a, a good driver for change. But this is perhaps a particularly marked form of what I'm describing in terms of the low-hanging fruit gone. Because crude oil will not be with us for that much longer at this rate of consumption. And so what we have here is a massive driver for change which is in exactly the direction we want to go. An economic driver which says, stop this oil dependence. Let's start finding alternative ways of, of ground transport at least. Air transport, perhaps we have to use oil and kerosene for some years to come. But ground transport, we have to start financing the transition away from, from this area. Now, I've, I've already mentioned rising sea levels. There's the challenge of rising sea levels. I, I quite like this curve because the, uh, I, I was Chancellor of the University of Liverpool and Proudman Institute up in Liverpool simply did something unexpected. They went into the historic records of the British Empire. Now, uh, you will know the, the Brits measured everything in sight and they kept records of everything they'd measured, very carefully conducted, and so the Proudman Institute got hold of these records on sea level height around the entire British Empire and then plotted it up. So the advantage of this is that the, the Proudman Institute uh, data is then matched up to satellite data and it all takes us back further in time to 1870. So what, what we have is a rather good record of the average sea level uh, uh, position going right back to 1870. And this rise overall is, uh, is a bit over 25 centimetres, uh, which doesn't sound too frightening. But if we go on, you see this curve is still going up, and it's going up faster and faster. If we go on going up at this uh, continued increased rate, then we're headed towards a metre plus. It, it all depends. I'm afraid it might depend on when our economies collapse. Right, so I hate to put it that way, but there is that alternative. Or if we find other ways of energizing our societies. Um, the, the red dots are, are average air temperature, and the, the Brits, as you know, uh, have these boxes which measures air temperature in the shade six feet above ground, etc. It's all very normalized. That, that data set doesn't look so good. It's only because the heat capacity of air is so much lower than, than of water. And so the rising sea level is a good thermometer. It's telling us the temperature rises as the sea expands. But the sea level is now expanding over the last 10 years faster than it was before, about a uh, bit more than one third faster. And the, the reason is twofold. One, the melting of glaciers around the world and ice on land such as Greenland and Antarctica is proceeding now at a very much more significant rate and so there's a higher rate of sea level rise because of that water going into the oceans. And secondly, because of the change in, in weather patterns and wind behaviour, which we're experiencing through extreme weather events, etc., because of these changes we're seeing more increased heat being taken up by the ocean. So we're experiencing a pause in the rate of which the air temperature is going up, but the ocean temperature is going up faster as a result. <clears throat> right. This is the most recent Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report. Here's their 
uh, sea level rise report taken from a whole bunch of different data only going back to 1900. Um, this, this is the change in the upper ocean heat content. You see that it's beginning to go up much more quickly here. Arctic summer sea ice extent, that, that is a, a, a pretty serious uh, uh, state of affairs up in the Arctic. Temperature rise in the Arctic region is roughly two to three times the global average. Um, and the reason is that as the ice retreats, the albedo of the region, the reflectivity of sunlight back into space, is reduced because seawater absorbs energy much more efficiently than ice. And this is, has taken us to 50% of where we were before in extent. But if you actually look at the volume of ice remaining, it's considerably less. We've gone from an average of six meters to one meter thick. That means the remaining Arctic summer sea ice will disappear re relatively quickly. Now, good news for those who want to exploit the, the area for oil and gas. Um, bad news though, for example, for all the countries in the Arctic Circle region and beyond, because the melting permafrost, which may have consequences for methane emissions, but the melting permafrost destabilizes the ground. So the, the heat waves in Russia have completely converted the Russian pub public from skeptics on climate change to believers on climate change. President Putin made, Putin made his first announcement on climate change in September last year. We will reduce our emissions by 27% by 2020 because of the threats of climate change. A little different from a speech he made in 2001 when I went to Moscow to talk to him about the subject, when he said, a bit of climate change, David, might be good for us. We'll have longer growing seasons. Now, the point about the, the loss of per, uh, permafrost is villages, towns destroyed. It's a bit like an earthquake. Um, the railway lines, roads destroyed because they're simply uh, uh, melting and, and uh, shifting ground. So, and here I come to a, a very important point. Each population in a particular geographic area of the world is as adapted as they can be to the local climate systems. In India, the monsoon has become a critical part of their economy. So if in one year the monsoon is 10% less than usual, they have massive problems with loss of crops. If in another year it's 10% more, the early planting of rice is destroyed by floods, and again, they have loss of crops, but they also lose lives through the, the flood damage, etc. So their economy has become critically dependent, plus or minus 10%, on the monsoon. Now, all the climate scientists will tell you that as we change the weather system, these monsoons are going to very sensitively react. Now, every society is adapted to its local conditions. So what, what we have is to get across the understanding that in Britain, yes, we may eventually produce wines that compare with France and Spain, but it might not be worth it if the country is getting shrunk down to a smaller and smaller size. The other part of it, of course, is that, and, and this was only sort of understood later on, the carbon dioxide, excess carbon dioxide is partitioned between the atmosphere and the oceans. And of course, the uh, carbon dioxide going into the oceans acidifies the oceans, and you can measure that, whoops, very simply by the pH, and wherever you measure it, the pH is going down. And this has major consequences for, for food production. So the, the starting point of the food chain is, for many, many species, the oceans. And those little coccolithophores with tiny, thin shells are very sensitive to, um, to acidity. So what we know that this is a, a, a major potential problem going forward in time. Now, I'm, I'm just going to come to what I think is the most important new curve produced by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change because it phrases things in a way that is easy for a negotiator such as myself to translate into the political sphere. 
This is quite a nice plot. Temperature rise since the 1861 to 80 period, global average, as a function of the increase in carbon dioxide emissions due to our behavior. And you'll see, if I may call this roughly linear, you, you will understand it's bouncing around. But the, the behavior does follow the theoretical expectation. So if we take theory in 2010 and run it backwards in time, you get this sort of margin of error, and it's, the data points are all within that margin. So we've got a bit of trust in running the, the data curves forward, and you see that by 2100, the most likely temperature rise, business as usual, is going to be 4.5 degrees centigrade. Now, 4.5 degrees centigrade is quite simply impossible. We won't get there because our societies, I believe, will have broken down before we get to that point. The, stability of our production systems will be very challenged with a temperature rise up at that level. And remember, we're saying the Arctic region, Central Africa, temperature rises are going to be twice the global average. So this is really quite a, a challenging possibility. How do we stay within this two degrees centigrade limit that the United Nations agreed that we should stay below? Interesting that politicians feel they can make a decision and then... <clears throat> Let, let behavior follow. Right? Now, we, we know that in order to stay below that 2 degrees centigrade, we need to be on this blue curve or below it. So we have already burnt a little more than half the carbon that we, our carbon budget is already half spent to stay below 2 degrees centigrade. At the present rate of increase of greenhouse gases, which is 1.8% per annum, if we carry on increasing exponentially in, in that way, by 2043, we've burnt our carbon budget. All right, so this isn't tomorrow's problem. Actually, we're running out of time in dealing with this. It means that if we did that by 2043, theoretically, we've got to drop to zero carbon dioxide emissions. We're not going to achieve that, obviously. But it means that the longer we leave it, the more and more difficult it becomes to make the transition. If we get, and all of my waking hours are now spent on this, if we get a good agreement in December 2015 in Paris, I'm going to measure the success of that agreement by whether or not this 1.8% rise, let's say up to 2020, switches round to a 3.2% per annum decay. So exponential increase, exponential decay. It's like controlling a foot and mouth disease epidemic. So basically, I'm saying, we know where we have to be. We have to see globally a reduction of 3.2% per annum by 2020. And then we stay within our carbon budget, but only just. Uh, that carbon budget giving us a 2 degrees centigrade temperature rise is not going to be a great world. You know, 2 degrees centigrade, I'm not suggesting is attractive. It's going to be quite challenging at 2 degrees. And the report that just came out on Monday from the IPCC spells out what even a two degree centigrade world looks like. We will have to adapt. Each society will have to adapt <coughs> to those changes. Uh, this is just to underline the fact that that rising middle class has shifted the behavior of uh, CO2 emissions from the OECD countries in blue to the non-OECD as we go forward in time. And I use this because I have to say to every country, you're in this as well. It's no good pointing as they did before at the OECD countries and saying, you guys get on with it. You're producing the CO2. It's the new middle classes around the world that are going to have to come along on this pathway. Now, I'm just going to quickly run through this because I, I want to... Solar energy. We've got 5,000 times as much solar energy arriving on the planet uh, uh, during the daylight hours that we need to convert into our energy resource. What we need is large-scale energy storage. That's the big missing part of our technology at the moment, large-scale energy storage. Richard Layard and I are pushing very hard for a global program to invest billions into large-scale energy storage. And 
We have a number of new technologies coming through. I just want to spin this to this point here. <clears throat> Last century's economy was a linear economy in which we take commodities, we convert them into marketable goods, and we throw them away. That's the model that has to be rejected now. What we need is a model that doesn't produce waste. This is a, a Manila waste tower, and I was recently talking in Manila, so I dug this out to embarrass them. They've now banned pl plastic bags in Manila, but that's only a start. What we need is to move towards a circular economy. Circular economy means every manufactured good should be designed to be recovered remanufactured and returned to the marketplace. So we create no waste in that process. And I, t I give you this car as the first circular economy car. This is Gordon Murray, a good friend of mine, who designed 50 Formula One winning cars, has set up a company to design the first, world's first circular economy car. This car's made of plastic bottles, recovered plastic bottles. The whole car is produced in five minutes on the manufacturing line. The chassis in 50 seconds, it's one piece of molded plastic. The average car today has 1,500 bolts in the chassis. This is one piece of molded plastic. If this car is in an accident or comes to the end of its day, put it back into the beginning of the manufacturing process, and five minutes later you have a new car coming off. So th this is new thinking. And then finally, let me leave you without a picture of the, 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 the following image. New Yorkers produce one billion grams of solid waste every day. One percent of that solid waste is nitrates and phosphates. We treat the solid waste around the world and put it into the oceans, and we're causing massive damage to the oceans as a result. And then we fix nitrogen out of the air, the Harbour Bosch process that I worked on for much of my life, very expensive, energy-intensive process. We make proteins, we eat them, we put them into the oceans. What would happen if you extracted the nitrates and phosphates, used the rest, the other 99%, for fuel or whatever? You would actually pay for the sewerage system with its very expensive products you extract. I've been banging the drum on this for ages, and at Slough we have a sewerage uh, disposal system Hooray, at last they've started extracting phosphates. They haven't got around to the nitrates yet. So we, it, the circular economy gets you thinking in new ways about how you avoid waste. Thank you. Thank you. That uh, was a very interesting talk. Um, my question is, what we have to do to change things. Is it enough? Somebody said something, and I think he's quite right. If everybody does a little, we will only achieve a little. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and Voltaire said, no snowflake in an avalanche ever feels responsible. <laughs> so uh, your point is absolutely right. Our behavior is imitated by other people. Right? So we, we, we are a society of people who influence each other. Each of us influences the other. Uh, I, I got into trouble when I was chief scientific advisor when a young woman asked me, uh, what should I do about climate change? And I, I looked at her and I said, stop admiring young men in Ferraris. Uh, <laughs> she, she was indignant and I wish I had been asked the question by a young man and I would have said, don't think of buying a Ferrari to impress young women. Um, the, the chief scientific advisor, the headline ran, urges women not to admire men in Ferraris. <laughs> now, uh, Ferrari complained to me. <laughs> <laughs> you see what I was saying, right? Mm -hmm. We have a society in which we tend to give a lot of status to people who are big energy spenders, or big spenders big time, who waste, right? I'm so wealthy, I can leave the doors open and heat my house and, yeah, you know what I'm saying. Our behavior is critical and, and so your question is a very good one because I, I think there has to be a much, much greater focus on behavior. What, what do we consider it is to be a good human being? 
Right? And at the moment, our society is totally focused on pounds, dollars, as determining who, what is a good human being. I'll let you choose the questions. <laughs> oh, right. OK. Yes. A uh, very consolidated and visionary talk. Thank you very much. And I have two questions. The first one, during your talk, you display very beautiful ge uh, ge uh, ge geometry and uh, uh, graphs. So I'm wondering whether you could use the same pattern to describe the relation between the government and the basic scientist pool. The second question, uh, is about you, if you are willing to share, like what, what makes you choose to be the bridge between the government and the basic knowledge pool? And if you look back, you think what, makes, makes, um, what helps you to achieve it and what you think you can do better? Thank you. Wow, okay. <laughs> so uh, are you from China? China doesn't need a chief scientific advisor. Right? Two-thirds of your Politburo members are graduates of Tsinghua University, and they are engineers and scientists. You have the most science-savvy uh, government in the world. Right? Now, maybe you, I'm exaggerating that you don't need a chief scientific advisor. Premier Wen Jiabao, I was very uh, honored to be invited over to advise him. And I, I said that, you know, I'm chief scientific advisor to Tony Blair, and he said, no, no, but just pretend you were our chief scientific advisor. <laughs> and, and so, yes, uh, let me rephrase this. Winston Churchill invented the post of chief scientific advisor here in Britain. And Britain benefited enormously from that. Right? We, we know the development of radar, the cracking of the German code. There were so many ways in which Britain benefited from a chief scientific advisor working closely with the prime minister at that time. And so we've kept that post going. Very few countries have got a chief scientific advisor. And there's a misunderstanding as well. I spoke to the Canadian government, they invited me over, and so they created a post of chief scientific advisor. But the government office for science that I ran here has 120 people and quite a big budget. I couldn't have anything like the impact without a real office for the, for the chief scientific advisor. I also managed to get chief scientific advisors into every department of government. I said after the foot and mouth disease epidemic, why haven't we got a chief scientific advisor in the department of uh, agriculture? So I, I think the answer to your question is really that I was a scientist in the laboratory here doing chemical physics um, and not thinking about going into government. Our post is such that you are parachuted from the university sector into government, and that is a key, to take a mature scientist who understands what it's like to be at the coalface of science. Wor I'd worked at science for 40 years with large research groups, you need that kind of experience to really understand what you, you need to do to get the knowledge base behind you. So faced with a foot and mouth disease epidemic, I went into our university sector and found these experts. If you're a, in the Ministry of Agriculture, you expect the experts to be in your ministry. So that's why I say I, I was acting as a bridge and I had to develop that bridge because it, it wasn't in a very sophisticated state when I came into government. And that foresight program was just one aspect of the bridge. Unfortunately, I think that would have to be our last question. And it's, it's a shame because I'm sure there's some really good questions coming from the audience. I hope uh, we might be able to catch Sir David at tea afterwards if he is around. Not not quite sure if that's happening. Not too wrong, yes. Um, but um, can we all thank Sir David for taking out his time and coming here? <laughs>